So again, let's just go back to the very first slide in this, in this deck. Uh, first slide here, you and I. This is just showing one version of this, right? The layer four, layer two, three. So it's, we, we're right. just gonna talk about this two layer input output layer model. Right. Now I'm gonna go down to uh, a more detailed version of that. Right. Okay, so this is uh, the slide they called dual model. So we're just gonna look at these, one of these two layers, these two, uh, one of these two, uh, an input output layer model. Mm -hmm. So we just have two layers of cells now. But we're gonna introduce another thing. We're gonna talk about multiple columns. Okay. So, and when we're talking about columns here, we're talking about the bigger columns, not the mini columns. These are roughly cortical about, columns. Cortical columns, or about half a millimeter. They're, um, they're just bigger, okay? Um, but it's a collection of. It's a collection of mini columns, and uh, it's just bigger in extent. Okay. Okay. So, in this picture here, we show three columns column one, column two, column three. Mm -hmm. um, the input layer in each of these columns is equivalent to the spatial pooler right. that we have today. It's the mini columns. Exact same mechanism, but the difference now is we have this orange input called location on object. Right. Okay. So we have these three columns, and you can think of them like the tips of your three fingers. Mm -hmm. So there's a column representing you know these three fingers, and each finger touches something, and each finger gets some input. Now it's it's really good to think about it in terms of touch because you can you understand that the three fingers move in somewhat independently. They're not touching the same part sure. of the object. Yeah. Yeah. They have different movements. This is important. Mm -hmm. So. But now what we're saying is we have a two-layer model for one finger, two-layer model for another finger, two-layer model for the other finger. And different columns. Each, one is, a, each right. one is one column. Yeah. And the important thing is that they communicate in the output layer. The output layer has these long-distance connections. So layer two and three have these long-distance connections that cost, go across columns. Right. Maybe like 16 columns in the cortex. Okay. Um, and layer five has that too, so this is a very noted feature of these long-distance connections. And what, the way you think about it is, is each finger is getting some information about an object. Mm -hmm. So my index finger is touching this coffee cup and says, oh, I'm feeling this feature at this location. That on its own may not be sufficient to identify the coffee cup. Probably isn't. Uh, I, could, I could identify the coffee cup by moving my finger in multiple locations. Mm -hmm. Imagine I'm not seeing it, right? I'm just re right. reaching into the black box and touching things. Yeah, but you can have one sensor. I can just do something. this like this. Yeah. It's kind of like looking at the world through a straw. I sure. can't see what the world is. But, but you got to move a lot. But I move a lot. But if I do it, I go, oh, that's mad. And this yeah. is that's the laptop and so on. Um, so that's the same as touching with one finger. Mm -hmm. But often you get to touch with multiple sensors at the same time. Sure. So if I had my three fingers touching this, I would get three different uh, feature location representations on the object. And potentially, you could identify. Yes, and so imagine what layer, the input layer is doing is representing not just features, but feature location pairs. It's, it's forming a sparse representation mm -hmm. of a feature at a particular location, just like we do with sparse representations in the temporal memory. Yeah, sure. A feature at a particular location in the sequence. So uh, it's a feature at a particular location. It doesn't identify the object necessarily. We have to have the second layer, which is a pooling layer. Mm -hmm. The pooling layer represents the object itself, and um, so uh, it actually learns to associate a, a specific representation for coffee cup mm -hmm. with a multiple feature location pairs. Right, so a coffee cup it consists of these features at these locations. Right, that's it. There's nothing magic about it. Yeah. Um, but at any point in time, each finger only gets partial input, and each finger may not have enough information to identify this. Right. But they all are trying to do that. So imagine the out, what, we, what the long range connections in the output layer let them do is, is settle on an answer that's consistent with all the inputs and do it very quickly. So imagine input on my one finger says it's object A, B, or C. The input on my other finger says it could be object um, A, R, and S. Mm -hmm. And the other one, the third finger says it could be object A, Z, and W. Right. And this is essentially doing SDR comparisons. Well, what's going to happen is they're going to form a, each the second layer in each of those columns. We're going to form a union of uh -huh. those three objects. Uh -huh. So I don't know which it is. It could be A, B, or C. I don't know which it is. It could be you know A, C, Z, and, and, yeah. and W. Yeah. So, but these long range connections essentially let them vote instantaneously yeah. or very quickly and say what's consistent across all this is A. Mm -hmm. So we settle on A. We have all this working. This is modeled now using our HGM neurons, so this is not like totally like fabricated. Sure. Um, so this says why you can identify objects very quickly if you have multiple fingers touching something, right. or why you can identify something very very quickly if I'm looking at it with my full retina. Yeah. I can just flash something in front of me, and very often I can recognize it because all the individual patches of the retina, uh, individual patches of V1, mm -hmm. 
or are basically modeling the same object, and they're all saying, I don't know, I have a partial knowledge about this. I'm yeah, so, it's, it's this, this, or this, and other one's saying it's this, this, or this. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. This. and yeah. so, so this, and then what happens now is that the, uh, the, the, the output layer, the object layer, which is stable, Right. Imagine now the output this layer. This is the pooling layer. This is the pooling right. layer. Okay. Um, it's it's saying this is a coffee cup. Every time I move my finger, the output layer still is stable. It says coffee cup, but the input layer is changing every time. Right. Because but every that time, voting is continuously occurring. It's always occurring. But once I know it's an object, unless I know once I know it's a coffee cup, there's there's no doubt about it unless one of the inputs is inconsistent with it. Sure. So what happens is, is if you look at this diagram again, the the coffee cup is projecting back down to the input layer, mm -hmm. and it's saying. Look, it's a coffee cup. These are all the feature location pairs that you might find on a coffee cup. Well, the column knows that, right? Uh, well, the output layer says it's, it's a, a coffee cup. And the column knows what features might be on. Yeah, well, it's, it's, basically, it's basically as a model of, it's basically a pooling layer. So the output layer, as it says, associated with me are 20 different input features, mm -hmm. feature location pairs. Right. That's a definition of the object. Right, right. And any one of those might be occurring right now. So what you what it projects back and it depolarizes the input layer and says these are the union of all the feature location pairs you might find on this object. Right. Now, if I know the location, because I'm about to move my finger, and so I actually miss I, I told you I know the new location, the new expected location. Because mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm moving my finger right now, and I know the new allocentric location. Let's say I magically know that. Yeah. Um, so now I say, okay, I know what the object is. It just consists of these feature location pairs. I also know what the new location I'm going to be on. And what you end up with is you end up with a prediction in the input layer of exactly the input you're expecting. Right. It says, okay, given the location and the object, I know exactly what I should feel. Mm -hmm. And then you have your prediction. And these predictions are all just through depolarization, like in HGM and, theory. And every one of these cortical columns is getting a, a different prediction, a different set of cells based on what it's experienced on that object. Uh, well, it's, they're all, they all individually learn what a coffee cup is. Right. But maybe just part of what No, actually, I'm arguing no. Okay. All right. If I'm doing this all in this region, I, I can do it all in one region, assuming I can do that. Right. Um, each column, actually, every individual column learns a complete model of the object. Uh -huh. This is a bit surprising. Yeah. This is twisting it around. It's right. This is the whole well, key. Even though it doesn't get all the sensory. Not at once. It doesn't get it all at once, but it will get it over time. Oh, I see. Because so one finger could. I will finger around. will. I will finger. I yeah. over time. I will. My finger will touch these different. And parts. I can do that with any one of my fingers. I'm doing it with all of my fingers. Yeah, yeah. You think about what you do when you get a new thing, or yeah. you're a child, or whatever. You're like this. Blah blah yeah. blah blah blah. Right. Put it in your mouth. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Every one of your every column is learning as much as there's a limit. Every column is trying to learn the entire three dimensional structure of objects. Mm. They're all running in parallel. Right. They're all parallel modeling. You know, so a region, I think of, if I said I've got 100 cortical columns, there's 100 models of the same objects. Uh -huh. um, and at any point... And I might recognize it with any one of those I could. I, if I, I could, had enough sensory input. If I had enough object, sensory input. Object. I could recognize the object with one finger if the, if the feature was unique. Mm -hmm. If it's not unique, then I have to do it through multiple touches. Right. It's the same way of looking through a straw. I could recognize anything by looking through a straw. If, if it's unique, I oh, that's Matt's nose, I got it. But if it's not unique, I have to look at the whole thing. Right. I have to move around. So you have this choice of balance between, you know, how many columns are actually touching the object or sensing the object at once and so on. It turns out that the adjacent columns in the cortex in a sensory region typically will be sensing the same object. Which makes sense. Yeah, of course, right? They're just adjacent. My fingers are typically yeah. touching the same object because, you know, it's not like my right finger is usually touching one object and my... My index finger, my middle finger is touching something else, and my yeah. finger finger something else. It's like that would be hard. Uh, we, we can grasp the thing at once. So, yeah. so this basic, this is the basic idea, and this is the basic circuit. Um, we've tested this extensively. Let me just show you a few other. Um, um, oh, I should just if we go and look at this the next uh, figure in the in the in the slide deck here. Um, just to remind you that we're building all of this using HTML neurons. Sure. So yeah, uh, this is key, right? Yeah. yeah. So. We didn't have to reinvent the neuron. Um, these are these neurons where we model the, the, the we're now including apical dendrites. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't really use them very much before. And that's the feedback. That's the feedback from the upper layer. Right. And, um, and then the basal dendrites. It's always been in the diagram. Yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> we haven't really, this, these models now require it. Yeah. Um, uh, we've done, just to show you this, this slide called simulation results, convergence time versus number of columns. 
this is just showing that when we model these things, we can model this convergence problem, this issue. So, um, uh, so uh, I, I don't know if I want to go through this in detail, but if you look at the section, uh, but the top of this diagram, we have uh, we've created a bunch of virtual objects. These are so simulated objects that have features at locations. That's uh, and we design them so that they're they're similar enough that you can't distinguish them very easily. You have to touch multiple places on them to distinguish them. Right. They all they have, they have similar features, and you know any particular feature you touch on location is not going to be unique. Um, and so we can in, this, in the B section here we show how long it takes for a single column, like a single finger, mm -hmm. to recognize one of these objects. And this is sort of the the, the activity pattern in um, the output layer over time. So time is on the x-axis. It's just a Sort of randomly touching. Something. Yes. Well, I don't know if it's random, but it's, it's but, going to. Yeah. Some, I actually don't know how super time did that. Right. Um, or UA. Um, but we're looking at, the, and then the vertical axis is the number of cells that are active at that point in time. So it's showing a union of the union of objects. Mm -hmm. So you see the activity is a lot in the beginning. If I just touch once, I have a union. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. I touch again and again and again. And then at some point it gets down to the, the after uh, I think it's about seven or eight on average. It says, "Oh, I know what this is." Right. And then it's then it's locked in. Yeah. If you do three columns at once, you still initially in the very first touch you might be ambiguous, but then right. quickly it locks. It can be locked in much quicker. You're just getting more data. Fair. Well, you're getting multiple. Yeah. It's like you're touching multiple parts of the object at once, and you're voting yeah. and, and collecting. Yeah. So you can integrate over time, uh, or you can integrate over multiple sensory inputs. Right. Okay. Right. Um, I mean, it, it, at a very high level, it's, it, it also sort of explains why you learn faster when you're using many senses yes, to learn something. Yes, exactly. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, you know, when we, if you given a new object and you haven't seen it before and you want to learn what it looks like, what you typically will do is you hold it in front of you and you turn around and look at the project. Every part of your V1, every part of V2 is learning simultaneously, yeah. independently and together simultaneously what that object is. So right. you're, building, you're building hundreds of models of right. the object. Not one model, yeah. hundreds of models. Um, one of the things you might uh, ask yourself is, is this really going to work? What's the capacity of a system like this? So this slide here called simulation results capacity, just, um, it, there's a lot of assumptions here, but we want to make sure that, you know, this is real, this could actually work. So how much could the neurons in a single column actually learn? Mm -hmm. And it turns out if you have a single column of reasonable dimensions. What would be reasonable dimensions? Oh, uh, like column? in this case, uh, we only assumed 150 mini columns. It's just much smaller than our typical temporal memory. Okay. Where we have two thousand um, uh, or two thousand forty-eight minicoms. Yeah, we're only assuming one hundred and fifty minicoms. That's kind of consistent with the half millimeter cortical column. Okay, um, and so you have like nine hundred cells in the input layer, which is pretty small. Yeah, and you have four thousand cells in the output layer, um, and under that kind of realistic assumption, which are smaller than we typically would model in the HGM mm -hmm. world. Um, you, a single column can learn somewhere between two hundred and three hundred three-dimensional objects. Wow. Um, and if you combine multiple columns together, you, you get more. So you can, it, it, because they, because no, uh, the, you, you can deal with this is it, noise. Is that a linear growth of uh, No, it, it limits out after a bit. I mean, it's just, it's just a capacity of how much you can act, how many synapses you can actually uh, uh, fruitfully employ on a neuron. Right. Um, so you kind of run into a maximum. But the point is, even a, even a single column or a very small patch of a sensory region can learn several hundred objects. Uh, it's not ten thousand. We don't need that. We just, you know, we're going to still have a hierarchy. We're going to do things in a hierarchy here. But, but you know, the, the, the few hundred things that are most important for this this column, the things it sees most often, um, and as a collection, um, they can learn more. I think this capacity will go up um, in in higher up in the hierarchy because uh, the the, the long-distance connections get longer and the dynamics change a little bit. But but the point of the matter is that this actually works. You can literally do comp, you know, complex processing in a single column.